Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to this uh, series of three sessions uh, on how to taste wine and how to taste like a pro. Uh, and we're going to look at some red wines on this session and then whites and then desserts and sparkling wine. Now, I know there's many of you out there and I've been told we have just about over a hundred people. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming along, joining me tonight and maybe uh, in the next two weeks if you want so. Uh, and to look at really, we're going to, first of all, have some fun together. Uh, we, we're going to have some fun. But you're really going to have a look at how to uh, taste and how does it really work? How do we get fluent at it? How do we discriminate against things that aren't or shouldn't be there? How do we know what you like or don't like? And how to actually build a kind of a mental roadmap um, there's a lot there's a lot to it there's a bit of abstract and a bit of concrete uh, uh, stuff on how to taste so I will do my best to impart all of that a few years of experience heavy drinking uh, that's me I do that very well I'm the Olympic star of drinking uh, but importantly is just really to have a bit of scientific approach at the start uh, a bit of theory uh, today and then we're going to have practice we've got three wines to look at so it does help if you have wines with you you don't have to it doesn't matter if you don't have but uh, ideally if you have a, a, a cabernet sauvignon it would be fantastic maybe a pinot noir and if you're pushing my luck maybe even a shiraz comparative tasting is what makes this quite easier now we will do a bit of question and answer uh, here or there uh, during the show we'll try our best i know there's many of you and we'll try to do the best we can so the first things first, uh, how to read a label? Well, it's very easy in Australia. I'm not going to cover the French or European labels because they are very complicated. You are on a need to know basis. That basically means you kind of supposed to know if you don't know, well, bad luck, you know, you're just missing out. In Australia, very easy. What's on the label is what you get. There's no really guessing. So we're going to grab a label here. I'm sure you're going to see it. Well, um, so this is a, um, a wins which I've chosen uh, for, my, um, for my Cabernet wine. It's one of the most popular. I really basically went to Dan Murphy and picked the most popular wines that they had there. So I wasn't trying to do too complicated. So I know my label is playing up a bit here. Um, so basically it reads here, wins Kunawa Estate, Kunawara. It's called the Siding and then Cabernet Sauvignon 2018. That's pretty much it on the front label. And the back label has a number of different information too. How does this really work? Well, all the information you really need to know is there. The producer, once he puts an information down, he's really much uh, confined to the 85% rule. 85% of, uh, of provenance, 85% of vintage, and 85% of grape variety. That means Cabernet Sauvignon is stated on this label, a minimum of 85% by Australian law has to be Cabernet Sauvignon. That still leaves room to blend with Merlot and Cabernet Franc, Malbec maybe, a lot of partners with Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, of course, if you go to Pinot, Pinot Noir, it doesn't make sense to blend anything else with it. Pinot Noir is a grape that shines on its own. But just that you know that by law, 85 only is required. Same is with the vintage. Uh, the vintage here is um, 2018. Uh, that means that you still the producer can, if he chooses to, put 15% or 14.99% of 2017, uh, should you wish to freshen up the wine. Now, by law, you need to have an address, a name of the wine, name of the label, and alcohol and uh, uh, approximate drinks. That's all is legal. So if the producer doesn't put Cabernet Sauvignon, it doesn't have to. It, 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 it can just put a generic name or maybe the name of a, of a label that he chooses. But if Cabernet Sauvignon is put on a label, therefore it has to be Cabernet Sauvignon. The same is for the, re, from, for the region, which is here labeled Kunuara. So 85% has to come from the region of Kunuara, which is a region that has been defined by law. It's called the GI, the Geograph Geographical Indicator. And is a boundary has been set around the main regions. There are many, many, many. In fact, Victoria has most of uh, wine regions, and 85% would have to come from within that particular region. In this case, Kunuara. Now, just very quickly, um, 
producer aren't forced or obliged to put any, apart from the uh, preservative, which is usually 220 or sulfur, they're not uh, obliged to tell you what they find or any other additives. There's a number of additives that goes into wine uh, and, and from enzyme nutrients to uh, clarifying agents, which are protein based usually, often are protein based such as milk, egg, uh, and you sometimes see traces of milk remain or traces of egg might remain. They're not obliged to tell you that. So it, there's a lot of things there that wine makers can do and not have to tell you. And there's a list long of additives. Um, they, they're not bad for you necessarily, I'm not suggesting they are, but they, they, there's, there's a lot of things that make just wine taste better. So let's move on because we don't have much time, although it's comfortable enough, but we're just going to look really at how to taste wine. I'm going to give you four basic tastes to taste wine and really then slowly slide you into peeling off different layers into getting into tricks of the trade, passing out how I do shortcut these sometimes and how do I base my, where does the knowledge come from to actually have, uh, um, to make those, those des decisions when you actually taste wines. What does help? What gets you there quicker? Now, the four basic steps are, are fairly easy and anyone can do this. Uh, those are sommeliers or professional tricks, but anyone can do this in the same way, uh, using that old metaphor I like to use, like driving a car, you don't have to know anything about the internet, internal combustion engine to drive a car. But I'm sure you agree with me that if you have a few driving lessons, you really will appreciate and you will be on your way. So same with wine. You don't need to know anything about the science, how to make wine and, you know, on the pointy end of things. But a few little guiding uh, session here and, and you will be uh, increasing uh, your enjoyment and appreciation of wine. There's no points given for the four... Uh, steps uh, uh, and you can guess if you want by the way just here I should tell you I should have had tell you before that uh, in this session I cannot see you you can only see me which is good for you not so good for me I like to see you all but if you have a question you need to use the Q&A on your zoom not the, uh, the other one, just a Q&A question and answer type it in there we will try to get as many as we can through. We will be limited. If everybody asks questions, there'll be 100 questions, as you understand. What we will do, however, is towards the end of the session, we leave it a bit open and a bit longer. And watch whatever questions are not answered, you can actually submit these questions to uh, on uh, uh, by email at uh, uh, events at, at the club, the, the events email that, that we've been using with you. And I will answer them all, okay? I will have time and I will answer them all. Now. Back to our four steps, very easy. First of all is the sight, visual inspection of the wine. Second is the smell, uh, identify aroma through, through your nose, obviously. I've got a big one, you can see there, very sharp tool. And taste, which is assessed both structure, um, flavor. And the last step, what is the last step? Maybe you don't know that one, the last step is the conclusion, very important. Think and conclude and assess. Okay, now we're gonna go and break this down, okay? And we're going to, like to do a theory, a little bit of a theory. I know you're getting thirsty. Feel free to just grab your glass of wine and dip in there and have a glass while I talk. <laughs> Perfectly great. But we're really going to use these wines if you have them. And we're going to actually use them in, in respect to our, conversa our, our, our conversation and talk. So the theory part, uh, the look. Well, the look is just a sight, appraisal of sight. A good tip is to slightly bend your wine in your glass and have a white backdrop here, right? Like a white backdrop. See my white backdrop, it doesn't really show well. Oh, you can show us here. That means you can have a really good assessment of the color and look at the rim and that really will tell you a lot about the intensity and the color. We'll tell you about the color, we'll tell you about the opacity, how transparent it is, and we'll tell you about the viscosity, okay? Um, which is quite great. You don't really need to spend more than five seconds here on these steps. A lot of clues of wines are buried in appearance, but unless you are tasting blind, that is not being blind, or in fact having too much to drink and being blind because of the alcohol, tasting blind means no identity of what the wine is. Really these steps can be redundant. So you have a look at it, you know, you already know if it's a white or red or rosé because you know what you've chosen, <laughs> you know the bottle. And, uh, but what it can tell you 
however, is an indication on age and intensity of color, which will lead to a few conclusions there, right? The smell is quite a big one. Um, so when you first start smelling, here's a bit of a trick here. Um, think big to small when you try to analyze. So most in my in my view or my in my profession, most people that try to assess wine, they really try to maybe look smart or they try to have the answers. Well, really, it's not about having the answers. Try to be more broad in your assessment of what the aroma is. It does the aroma lie in a fruit, in a vegetal, vegetal uh, or, or, or anything else, rather than really coming out of a single fruit character. So, but it's pace to go big to small, you know, citrus, uh, tropical fruit in white wine, and when it's red, it's red fruit, uh, blue fruit, black fruit, you know, th those are the ones. So fruits can be classified in different aroma. Now I have a slide here, and my very able assistant, Nick, will share that with you. You're gonna have a slide here coming up. Uh, and that will show you basically primary aroma, secondary aroma, and tertiary aroma. Now, if you look at here, the purple is your primary aroma. Primary aroma are what is most present in your glass when you smell. What does this mean? It just basically means grape derivative and uh, uh, aromas, which includes fruit, herbs, and floral notes. Aromas that come from fruit. The secondary aroma, which is in blue, are really aroma that comes from winemaking. Uh, and that, there aren't too many, really, honestly. Um, they're usually yeast derived because yeast is used to make wine, such as uh, 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 cheese rind or, or, or nut husk, almond peanut, sometimes even stale beer, sometimes oak can come from, uh, from secondary aroma. We'll show you how to pick oak in a wine. That's a good one too and tertiary aroma, which is your least present in most wines. This is really wines that comes from aging, usually in a bottle or possibly in oak, where oxygen had had an input. This aroma usually mostly savory, like roasted nuts, baking spice, maybe vanilla from the oak you're getting often, autumn leaves, uh, tobacco, old tobacco, like dried tobacco, uh, cured leather, uh, uh, cedar or sometimes furniture, furniture polish, uh, and sometimes coconut. Uh, thank you, Nick, for that amazing slide. So these slides come from Winefully. Uh, Winefully is a free online uh, 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 website, which you really, are, you know, I encourage you to go there. It's it's made for any types of level, from the neophyte to the intermediate. Uh, it's a great learning tool. I've actually based some stuff I'm doing here from Winefully, and certainly have gently borrowed uh, some of the graphs and stuff. So that's for your smell, which is really an important way, uh, uh, an important tool to assess wine. Third, of course, you guess it, it is the taste. Uh, you need to um, you need to use your tongue, your palate, uh, 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 and you need to swallow the wine in order to get aromas and, and, and flavors, uh, usually from the back passage of, of, the, of, of the nose. Now, our palate or tongue is quite dumb. Sorry, tongue, don't mean to offend you, but it's really only capable of having five, let's say four basic taste sensations, which are, again, probably no points for guessing there. You know them all, salt, bitter, sour, acidity. You may ask, you said five, what's the fifth one? Fifth one is umami, which has been discovered by a Japanese professor early 1900s. Uh, which is basically having discovered that there are some taste buds, buds on your tongue which will be sensitive to umami alone and nothing else. Therefore, it is a fifth uh, uh, basic taste sensation. What is this flavor or, or uh, sensation? Umami is, is as the Japanese uh, is, it, it's a, a savory sweet kind of aged sometimes. Very hard to put in word actually, but prawn has lots of it, the rice does have it. Uh, so does mushroom, mushroom is very rich in umami. And MSG, monosodium glutamate, big one in umami. So apart from this, uh, the, the palate and the tongue can only discover, can all also discover texture. Texture is also quite an important. We're gonna go back to texture a bit later. I'm not gonna get lost too much here on, on taste. Uh, um, so the tongue will make up if it's, high in acidity, low in acidity, bit of saltiness, bit of sweetness. Uh, you can't smell sweetness though, 
uh, uh, since only your tongue can detect it, but you can actually have an idea of how sweet the wine can be by having a fruit and a fruit comparison there. Uh, and very few wines are salty. Uh, salty was a phenomenon we had during the drought years uh, where there was salt coming up in uh, in the earth. Uh, you could see crystallization even in some vineyards of salt because of the drought, which actually tended to come through. Uh, and also other wines sometimes can have a bit of that, that salt character. So really those are the, uh, uh, the, the way the mouth palate tastes, but it's really through the back passage of the nose that you can assess a strawberry being a strawberry, a raspberry being a raspberry, a plum being a plum. If you block your nose like this, right? And you speak funny, you, you, and you taste some food, and all of you know when you have a cold, you know, you, can't, you actually can't taste much. And that's really because a lot of those flavors becomes aroma back in the back passage of the nose and makes you assess that the strawberry, yes, bit of sweetness, lots of acidity, hey, but it tastes like strawberry because of the nose doing its job twice. The nose, very important tool, okay. Lastly, the palate can also assess length. Very important. I'm gonna go back at it again because repetition makes perfect. Repetition is a great learning tool. That's how I learn. I was a bit slow at school and I had to repeat it. I had to have it repeated many times. So we're gonna go over this session again, uh, but peeling it even further. But length is very important because the better wines will always give you longer flavors. Do not confuse this with, let's say, vinegar. Okay. If you have vinegar, it's going to have a very long lasting flavor. Not very nice. Acetic acid, you know, mouth perking, acidic, not good. However, if you have a long lasting flavor with harmony and elegance that pushes vinegar aside, really, this is telltale of a great wine. This is really where your money goes. If you pay 40, 50, 100 bucks or north of that, that's really what the wine should taste like. It should have perfect length, a very soft letdown, like from a cloud, and really all in harmony. I always get this metaphor of an orchestra, a musical ensemble, where you play many, many different instrument play. You want to hear a harmony of instruments. You don't hear the drum too high, or the violin screeching, is, you know, out, out of sync or maybe even too loud. It has to be all homogenized. Okay, so this is very important. The length is really the telltale of quality. Okay, this is so the longer it lasts, the longer the, the better the quality. And you can count, count that in seconds. The French call that caudalie. You try it with water, you have a glass of water, yeah, three, four seconds. You have a glass of a nice Cabernet Sauvignon like this one, I would probably count, you know, eight, nine seconds. And you can go further than that. So quite it's a bit nice, a nice, nice little trick. A few helpful tips now, okay, just to get you excited a little bit, you know, get you out of your listening mode. What about that smell that you can't stomach? Ah, what is that? I have it for my daughters. I mean, they're not that young anymore. They're, they're teenagers and, and 120 plus. But she always does that. Ah, that's disgusting. So it can happen. So the smell can be difficult to move beyond the Venus flavor. So Venus flavor can be off-putting. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. But a good technique is to alternate between big sniff and then a small sniff. Okay, and it's more gentle. Just get used to the nose and relax into it. Now, to maximize this nose, another good trick is to do the swirl. See that swirl? Perfect swirl. Of course, always a joke that the perfect swirl means what? It means that you look like a professional. That's all you want to be looking at, you know? People will tell you, wow, this guy's a professional. Look at this perfect swirl. Apart from looking like a professional in just two seconds, how lucky are you? It also will coat the wine along the glass and increase oxygen. Oxygen is a very important tool. Let's call it tool or whatever you want to call it. It can be the biggest enemy and the greatest friend. We're going to go further into that a bit later again. Now in here, what it does, it just really maximizes flavor. Think about a flower. There's many flowers behind. By the way, I took that picture from uh, uh, when I was last in Alsace with a group and some of you might remember if you want to call. And this is Niedermorschwil name of a village that you should not attempt without two or three glasses of wine. So don't say it now. We'll have two or three glasses. I'll ask you again, what's the name of the village? And you will tell me. It's a real tongue twister. Now by back here, coating your glass like a flower that will open. 
Okay, rather than looking at a bud, you're looking at a flower that has opened, and that will maximize aroma. Very important. So, very good trick. The trick is never to fill the glass, to have a little bit there. So, you have the glass is tempered, a lot of room here for the aroma to, 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 to raise, and then tempered so that you know it's going to be right here, you know it's going to be right here. So, it tempered, it concentrates right here, and your nose can pick it up. Nose, another tip. Don't, don't go too hard on the nose. This is not a civic competition. Like, you know, I'd have to fill your lungs with it. But if you burn and start to, to go over the tops, just go, pull back, smell your forearm. Don't ask me why. That's weird, isn't it? It's like you had a shower. And then go because it neutralizes your, your, your aroma, your nose, and go back. Ah, oh my God, it worked for me. So there's a lot of stuff happening in the nose. So really be, pay extra attention to that step which is that sort of nose, okay? Um, when you taste, try to get more flavor out of your mouth. I'm gonna show you what I do. It sounds disgusting. Now warning, beep, beep, beep. This is not a course in etiquette. This is a course in wine tasting. So we can make nose, we can spit, we can be totally non-sociable. This is fine. So I'm gonna show you what I normally do to maximize air interaction. I'm gonna let a little bit of air through and gurgle it. And that's going to maximize air, like, like I did here, to swirl it, to let oxygen uh, go and the, the wine coat the side of the glass and oxygen interact. I'm going to same with the palate. I know it sounds bad, but that will increase. If you have a motor in your car and you put a turbo charger in there, uh, you, you all know what a turbo does, it just speeds up your motor, you go faster. A little bit like that, okay? So it just maximizes that intensity of flavor that I'm getting. Just maximize that. So practice with water huh, is a good, good, good way to do. Um, don't overload it. Just have a little sip. And, 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 but when you have a sip, another trick is to not just have a little sip and swallow. Just chew it. Chew it in a mean that do the washing machine stuff cycle. You know, really make sure that it goes everywhere and then swallow it or spit it if you have to spit. You know, it's fine too. You guys don't have to do that. I do have to spit professionally. Uh, otherwise, I probably wouldn't be alive because of all the large amount of consumption. But that's sort of making sure that all of the mouth takes part uh, in the liquid. And then when to swallow, don't just dismiss it. You know, people, I see so many people I'm going to drink, oh yeah, what are, you going to, what are you going to do tomorrow? What's for dinner tonight? Blah, blah. No, 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 you just missed it. Those few seconds, once you swallow it, actually quite important because remember what I said about the length. This is the telltale. This is going to tell you how it's going to leave you. What is the farewell? Is it like a cliff, which commercial wine, cheap wine will do? Or is it a nice let down from a nice soft cloud, like a, a landing of a plane, right? And how balanced, how harmonious it is. That really is your tell, your, 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 your ticket to tell you if the wine is quality, expensive or not, if it's been well made. Okay. Are you still with me? Cool. Okay. Now, um, we can progress. If there is some questions, we're going to look, look at it later. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, we're going to not peel it. And after that, we're going to really look at those three different wines. I'm going to take my first wine I have here the wins came on a Sauvignon, it's called the Siding. It's about 12, 13, but I know I do a lot of advertising for Dan Murphy, but that's, that's not the point. But it's extremely cheap wine with a lot of pleasure. It's 12, 13 dollars, I think. Uh, that's 2018. Now, what exactly are we assessing? So, first of all, we need to look at the color. As you remember, we're gonna go through the steps and, and just peel them off a bit. So, the color really will tell you a number of things, but also there's not only the color. Look for like density, viscosity, and flocculation. Flocculation is bits of stuff that might be floating in your glass. You might say, oh, horror, why should it be? Well, it can be. And how intense does it look? So what does density tell you? So if a wine is dense or the opacity, let's say, so if it's transparent, just to use another word again, the wine might be just lighter and less concentration. If a wine is darker and more opaque, you can't see it through, it's strong color, most likely this wine, this is a conclusion you can make, it's made from a warmer area with more maceration, 
or it is made with uh, a red skin that has been fermented and aged in contact with the wine for a long time. But all you can say that it's going to be more in body and flavor than a light wine. That kind of makes sense. Okay. So um, you can also tell the the uh, the uh, the acidity from the color sometimes. Um, a wine with a higher acidity, which is a low pH, uh, usually has a red tinged rim, which here is quite red, red tinged. Uh, and if it's blue tinged, it's a lower acidity. So, and purple on the red wine usually means a younger wine. Now, sometimes the wine can have an amber, slightly darker brick red hue. Hue, hue, <laughs> hue. Sorry, I haven't been drinking much yet. Um, and that really indicates a level of oxidation and usually age. Okay, one with age, you usually have dark color. So you can already tell quite a little bit from the color, okay? Now the viscosity, when you swirl it, that's the viscosity. Viscosity, the French call this legs. Uh, what does legs mean? It means the level of oiliness the wine has. How viscous? Is it like oil or is it like water? Again, what does that mean? If the wine is more oil-like in texture, it means it has a higher level alcohol. Already you mean it's got from a warmer area or from a riper vineyard, or maybe it's just a, a, a wine that is a grape variety that likes high, high alcohol. More water-like substance, more water-like viscosity, low alcohol. So uh, in Australia, very often they are legs and it's the French used to assess them and how Slow, because they look like legs, you know, the French like to look at legs, okay? So it's like how small, how, how slowly they drip, like a tear, how slowly is a tear dripping down? If it's slowly and bulges, that's viscosity. If it's straight down, you know, it's, it's really quite liquid. Uh, suspended particles, well, Pinot Noir is unfiltered and nothing can have a cloudiness appearance, which is normal. So don't worry about that. Most wines are fine and usually they're quite bright in appearance. Okay. Now, so much for the first step. We've got two more steps to go. Big step is the nose. Okay. The most important part of wine tasting. Okay. As when you taste food, one of the most important parts with food is a sense of smell. So we will look at the aromas. Now I've got another slide that my uh, amazing assistant Nick will put forth, which will look at aroma and flavors, which is misspelled because from an American website, also from Wine Folly. Thank you, Wine Folly. But this is really to make it easy for you. So you're here looking at the different characteristics. Those are the family names. I would have vegetal as another one, but it's a small category. But rather than actually trying to smell and come up with, oh, this is a, maybe a bit of raspberry. Now just fall back and look first, oh yeah, he has fruits. Everybody at least should put their glass on their, on their nose now. Smell, you can have a souvenir if you, if you have one. What does it smell like? Well, yes, it has fruit. And now we can look at this category. So what fruit is it? Cranberry, cherry, strawberry, raspberry, plum, blackcurrant, and so on. Uh, all the way to tart, sweet, stewed candy, which is a riper spectrum. I think here what you have is um, maybe red, red fruit or black, bit of black fruit even, not so much red fruit, red fruit, is cool climate, high acidity fruit, raspberry, strawberry. Black fruit is riper. Okay, so already if you know your grape variety, this is Cabernet Sauvignon by the way, you should be anticipating what fruit spectrum it goes for. Cabernet Sauvignon does not have red fruit normally. Okay, it usually has black fruit. And which black fruit? Well, you can pick here. But one that comes to mind, yes, I'm sure you picked it, thank you very much, is black currants. There's a bit of black currant here if you have a, a nice Cabernet and if you have a Windsor or whatever. And that's a classic in Cabernet. So already you can look smart in front of your guests that you want to impress by knowing that Cabernet Sauvignon has black currant mostly and maybe a bit of blackberry, maybe sometimes with a plum. And you can already said, you know, you can mention it and you will be most likely right. What else does Cabernet have? Well, here, let's go beyond fruit. Often when you smell, it's probably better not to go because there's so many smells, flavors uh, uh, in a wine, just identify something easy and, and overall. Don't try to really try too hard because you can get lost and then you get frustrated. We don't want you to be frustrated. It's better to really pull back sometimes and just look, if you're just happy with fruit, yeah, it's a fruity nose, okay, fine. But if you can go further, okay, we get blackberry, but further even, 
I'm smelling here, and cabernet is a classic, this element of eucalyptus or green capsicum, which really comes from a compound that is present in cabernet sauvignon called metoxyparosine, just to confuse you all, which is also present in sauvignon blanc. Did you know that cabernet sauvignon is the, uh, sorry, I'll repeat that. Sauvignon blanc is the, gra is a, is the father of uh, cabernet sauvignon. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is a child of Sauvignon Blanc. Therefore, they have family traits and they have this metoxyparosine, aka green capsicum, or when you pick a leaf from a tree and you crush it in your hand and you open your hand and you smell your hand, you have that green leaf. Cabernet Sauvignon has that, especially from WA. Here from Kunuara, there's a little bit of that. There's a little bit of that green capsicum hint. Then another category, which is other and oak, which is, is quite wide. It can go anywhere from anything that has been cooked, smoked, processed, or anything else. So the mushroom would be a vegetable for me, but here you have, uh, you can have chocolate, tobacco, uh, uh, anything smoked, uh, and then all of the spices, of course, um, and oil, black tea, graphite, dried leaves, and, and, and coffee. Coffee is also a big one. Thank you so much, uh, Nicola. Um, for this amazing slide. So this is how, by looking at main families rather than just a single aroma, which is very hard to get because you know it, it's very hard to do, in, in, even for me. So you look at major sort of families. So is it floral? Does it smell like a flower? Like most Riesling might do. Is it fruity? Most wine would be fruity. If it is, maybe you can venture further. What kind of fruit is it? Is it vegetal, like grass, grassy, like Sauvignon Blanc? or mushroom or, or dried leaf or is it other epicurean i usually used to call that epicurean which could be anything from dairy butter to uh cheese tab tobacco and, and, and coffee so um and of course then you know your palate will be reinforcing uh this character which is uh, which is which you have on on, on the on the nose now there's something i'll tell you also which is a, a funny uh funny method it's called the disassociation method or if you're really stuck you can also try to smell the wine not for too long okay and then disassociate yourself with it and try to not think and just totally relax and try to pick up what's there basically in other words is my meditative approach don't try too hard just really relax into it and no pressure and just be amazing uh, amazing what what actually can can come through so we're going to now go to practice. We already practiced with this, but one best way to taste wine is to actually compare them. Because if you, another metaphor, I'm very good with metaphor, I love them. If you look at one person against a white wall, let's say, it's very hard to tell its height, his or her height or, or anything else. But if you have a number of people, like on this you know, police lineup, you, know, you can easily tell the height, maybe color of skin and other attributes, you know, uh, thin, small, whatever. The same is wine. So a wine by its own is much harder to assess than a wine that you have in a group of wines because when you really look at wine, you can then assess the levels of intensity in each of these wines. So I'm going to pick up the Cabernet Sauvignon again. We're going to give you a rundown. We can do this together. Uh, we've done it many times now. You know what the color is. Sniff, you know what, what it is. It's got a bit of black currant. I think a bit of citrus or fruity. Um, and definitely a bit of that green capsicum. Not green capsicum here. I'm going to call that crushed leaf. I think it's more, more appropriate. Medoxyparosine. And just an overall willingness that, yes, it's, it's, it's nice. It's, I want to it almost salivate. I, I want to I wanna taste it. So it's quite important. I, I, you know, it, it's a pleasing. So it's an overall pleasing nose. On the, on the palates, pay attention. We're going to do it together. Pay attention to a number of factors. Acidity, how going to impact you? Now, most wine have acidity because they're relying on, uh, grape is quite an acidic fruit and also a fruity fruit, but there's a lot of acidity there. So most wine will be high on acidity. But pay attention to how high, medium, or low it is. Intensity, how much flavor is there? Low, medium, high. This scale, three notes only. There's only three notes, very hard, very easy, okay? The next session, session two, we'll actually look at actually writing tasting notes, but I'm going to go over that again. So the palette. B. 
medium to low acidity, it's quite, uh, quite, you know, just bordering on medium acidity, quite medium body weight. Um, and then you have, again, black current, I'm getting black current. But there's something I'm getting here, especially in Cabernet Sauvignon, I started with the most obvious wine with you all guys, because with sparkling wine or maybe a white wine, they may be a bit harder to sometimes get. Cabernet Sauvignon is a big one, it talks loud, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit more brush. And what's really important with Cabernet is the texture. Now, texture is a really big factor that you will get on your palate. Remember, the, the tongue will five basic taste sensation and also texture. The texture is, and I wish I kept that book I had when my kids were little. It was called The Tale of the Dinosaur. <laughs> it's quite funny. So in each page, you had a dinosaur, same shape all the time, but the pages back were different. And the page had a tail, which was made up of different texture, different material. One page was a um, sandpaper, one, one, one was a um, silk corrugated iron felt. And the kid, of course, as you get now, you, you, you put your, you run your, your fingers through it and you can feel a texture. The same with the palette. It's, this book was so great because it's exactly the same. Now here on my Wins Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet has lots of tannins. Tannin is like, you know, when you leave a tea bag for far too long, say 10 minutes and then you drink your tea, you have a mouth prepping effect. The tannins bind naturally with your saliva. It makes your mouth go dry. Also binds with protein. It looks different with meat. So it dries up your, your saliva and mouth prepping. Cabernet is full of it because thick skin comes from the skins and it pips to some degree, sometimes a bit of oak. Okay. So, and that will have the impression of a ruggedness and that gives a texture element to wine. Okay. Texture often can come from alcohol. Alcohol is the main contributor to texture. Alcohol gives an oily, rich feeling. Another metaphor, if you have skim milk and full cream milk, skim milk is much, much, texture of, of the two is very different. It's, it's the same in wine with high alcohol and low alcohol, okay? A, a fuller bodied, a fuller feel, uh, uh, and more sort of body, uh, body uh, solid extract. So here, tannins are very important because that attributes for a, a texture and also for lifespan in the wine. And that will also determine what food will go with the wine. Obviously protein, as I mentioned before, because they bind naturally with tannin, such as meat, um, red meat, red meat, cooked, rare even. Uh, now if you have your glass of um, Pinot Noir, this is a Pinot Noir from uh, Yarra Valley. Uh, it's innocent bystander. Um, yeah, here we are, innocent bystander. My um, my uh, green screen is playing up a bit. So if you swirl it here, we're going to go to the upper. It's going to be much quicker now, of course, because we've done the heavy work. You have done the heavy work, sorry. And we've done the theory part. So the color, a bit lighter, more transparent. Remember what I said, therefore, it should be a bit lighter already on the nose. Wow. Different communication. Different conversation here, guys. It's more perfume. It's more, if I put a gender on it, it's, it's feminine, you know, it, it's subtle, it's, it's sensuous even. It's got spice. Now here we are in the red fruit. Remember what I said about red fruit? Red fruit are usually from wines from cooler climates, always higher acidity. Cool climate wine, like Victoria, or Yarra Valley in particular, Geelong, uh, Monitan, they would have higher acidity because it's colder. Right? So acidity in the fruit is higher. And therefore you're more on a red fruit spectrum for red wine. And typically Pinot, it pays to know what Pinot tastes like in terms of taste and aromas. Pinot often has a wide gamut of aromatic spectrum, all the way from cherry. Cherry is a big one. Sour cherry, black cherry, raspberry on the less ripe, and then going riper, plum, uh, maybe even jammy. And also you could have strong savory input. A lot of Pinot are savory. Often they are like uh, a hang meat, uh, sausages, salami, uh, uh, or sometimes you can go further, like uh, the French call them often when they age, they call them uh, uh, subwa, have a bit of subwa. What does this mean? Forest floor. Imagine putting your nose on the floor of a forest where you have decaying leaves, wet ground, mushroom, fresh spring, fresh uh, sprouting fern, maybe, you know, it's sort of half decaying and rich, sort of uh, uh, potpourri kind of thing. Uh, so 
Pinot is, is quite, and it can go all the way to fecal. Did I say fecal? Indeed, I did say so. Banya, chicken poo, uh, it's also known to be used, not in a negative term either. So it's a bit of a wild one, but it's got a lot of intricacy. Now, I'm getting this aroma, a bit of cinnamon richness there, cherry, big, big black cherry, not red cherry. And remember, everybody will get their own interpretation of a smell. And if to you this wine smells like your grandmother's linen cupboard, well, then it is your grandmother's linen cupboard. Okay, it doesn't matter. It's whatever makes sense to you. It doesn't, you know, it, I'm just saying the, the stereotype here about what Pinot Noir should taste like. On a palate, pay attention on the palate about the level of acidity compared to the previous wine. We're gonna hit much higher notes. Pay attention to the body weight. It's gonna be more narrow. It's gonna be delivering in a more narrow sort of scale like this, right? And also pay attention to the elegant subtlety of this wine while having intensity of flavor. This is the Pinot Noir trick, people. Elegant, subtle, yet intensive. Think about the Iron Fist in a velvet, in a velvet glove, you know? It looks very smooth and soft, but it's power there. Okay, let's go for it. A great buyer, yeah? this one for Dan Murphy, about 20 bucks, 20 plus, just, just, just on the, you know, just about 20. Tannins are much softer. They're there, but it's so tiny. They're more like silk rather than um, sandpaper. Acidity is slightly higher, slightly thinner on the palate, okay? So it's very, it's very much fold, falls into the mold of what a Yarra Valley Pinot Noir tastes like. When you taste wine, in order to develop, this is a skill you can take on for, for yourself now to uh, increase your tasting capabilities. It really pays to look at varietal and style that are classic from the area they come from. So Pinot Noir makes sense to be from the Yarra Valley. Some of the best Pinot Noir come from there. Cabernet makes sense to be from Kunuara or WA, because some of the best come from there. When you go to Shiraz, we're gonna to go to Shiraz now. I have a pepper tree, is this that's not number one? Number one on the um, on the website. This is very bad a depiction of my label. Uh, okay, but you get what pepper tree is. This wine is uh, a cool climate, so it's got various different regions. Uh, they make one straight from South Australia as well. It's a 1917. Uh, and it makes sense to get a wine that is from Barossa, McLaren, Shiraz can be almost from anywhere in Australia because we do it well in most places. Now, Shiraz, we can taste Shiraz together. This has a lot of, I'm, I'm going to be very critical. Now, this is actually going to be good, actually. I, I thought I'm not going to criticize the wine. I got nothing to lose. This is not my wine. Never tasted it before. I've got an excuse. Tasting it now. I'm going to put it to shred in a positive sense so that we can learn from experience. To me, this wine, Pepper Tree Shiraz 17, hopefully nobody is from Pepper Tree Vineyard here on the call, yeah. There's a very obvious, it's out of it's out of sync, okay? It's out of sync because there's a strong vanilla character. Remember when we said vanilla being a, one of the tertiary character, also coming from oak, that is an oak emphasis there. How do you pick oak? Well, okay, here we go. One thing is the nose. Vanilla, maybe a bit of coconut, bit of richness there. And on the palate, again, that vanilla, coconut spice, coconut, spicy coconut, that is oak. And that, that just feeling that the fruit has been subdued. So once you get fruit into it, you can really look at that balance on the nose and the palate. And if it's out of balance, like your orchestra ensemble is playing out of harmony, the violin is too strong, you can't hear the, the flute, for example. Well, that's out of balance. And that's what's happening here. That oak is so strong on the nose. I mean, I'm, I feel like I have my head in a, in a barrel and smelling vigorously. You know, it's just that barrel smell. But there is sweetness and plum as well. So it's quite a richness there. Usually the rule is the richer the fruit, the more oak you can chuck at it. But you can't put too much oak that covers the fruit, which I just think, unfortunately, that's just happening a little bit here. On the palate, nevertheless. Shiraz is all about subtle. Here, texture is about a creaminess because the alcohol is higher, the sweetness is higher. It just, it's a warming wine. It's almost glowing a little bit, bit of spice. Shiraz has pepper spice often, 
and the red fruits, not red fruits, but the fruits are black fruits. Blackberry, mulberry, plum. Maybe add a bit of licorice uh, uh, and sometimes tar or sometimes uh, floral can be a bit of rose here or there. But Barossa will be that chocolatey licorice, that richness. Uh, the body is richer, alcohol is higher, uh, the wine looks more opaque, uh, and that's really Shiraz. So it's a crowd pleaser because it's a, it's a big man, it's giving you a big hug, you know, it loves you. So it, it's quite an easy one to appreciate. Still a bit out of balance here, the orc stands, shines through, it's just a pity that they've done that. Um, and, and, and I just want to mention that uh, if you are with me the whole series, you don't have to, by the way, you're free to do whatever you want. But in series three, I would like to teach you how to be discriminate. You know, we are not doormats. We just not say hi to everyone and give them all big hugs. Some wines are just no good. Some are just crap. Did I say that word? No, I didn't. And really, how do you discriminate against it? When we are judging wine in wine shows, like the Vic Wine Show, which we have about 800, or any other shows that, that you know, I do around the country, uh, uh, it is exactly that. We need to be discriminate. Whatever is not the cut is just straight away put aside, put aside, put aside. Why would you drink a bad wine uh, that you paid with your own money? No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't actually go back to it and buy it again. So that's session three plus the sparkling wine and sweet wine. Session two will be about putting your thoughts down. You see, this is the best way to remember and apply what I've taught you today by actually writing it down. Not that you need to write a tasting note, and you're probably never gonna write a tasting note. Who cares about tasting notes anyway, really, apart myself and me and, and I, because <laughs> that's what I do all the time. But really, but the fact of having an abstract thought to a concrete sort of wording, because most people I see tasting, they're like this. Oh yeah, yeah, that tastes like, oh, what's it, what's it? Oh, you know what it is, you know, oh, I don't know what it is. Oh, no, no, you know that, that you know, it's a kind of, they can't find a word. So try you know the, the exercise to find the appropriate word or adjective is a difficult one but it's required to be fluent into the art of tasting so writing a tasting note will be next week where we will be looking at white wine uh so for next week if you want to come along we're looking at a chardonnay cool climate a riesling and a sauvignon blanc riesling from the claire if you can sauvignon blanc from marlboro new zealand if you can now you guessed it, it's the end of my 45 plus four minutes session, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna leave you. There's probably quite a few questions. I know there is quite a few. So we're going to look at um, answering some of your questions. Um, right, so, uh, sorry, forgive me when I'm reading, I'm a bit slow. Okay, good one. So I got one from GD Price here. I was told that putting some salt on the front of your tongue and you react to this, that is where your taste bud comes through. If no reaction, put salt further on your tongue. If it works, is this possible? I'm going to be harsh, no harsh, not harsh, but I have my own thoughts. The tongue, uh, the tip of the tongue, the sides, bitterness, uh, astringent to the back. No, bitterness at the back, astringent side. Forget about it. Honestly, in my view, forget about it. When you have a wine on your palate, it happens all the same. Try not to localize. It might be true that the, the taste receptors are localized on your tongue, but the sensation of feeling it isn't. I can't, you know, maybe salt and sweet, maybe a little bit, but if you have a sweet uh, thing in your mouth, it, it's a sweetness overall, same with saltiness. So, you know, that's an easy answer. Um, Clark is saying, what is your suggestion when on L plates oh, and experimenting with new wines at Murphy, Pinot Noir or Shiraz, when there are hundreds to choose from, it's better to stick with makers or regions. There is a price point to learn good, bad, or a variety. Tricky question. So when you're on L plates, first of all, I assume that is not a actually driving L plates because then I would say straight away, do not drink. Okay. Uh, it's a hard one uh, being a sort of uh, thrown into the midst of hundreds and thousands of different um, different different labels out there. So, stay classic, um, stay classy. Now that's another line from another movie. Uh, 
classic as in what we're going to do over the Swiss session, and I repeat three of them. If you want to do Pinot Noir, look for Yarra Valley. Uh, uh, try not to, you know, there's other regions that do very well, so it's Tasmania, by the way, uh, or, or Macedon, Geelong, and, and Gippsland. Uh, but, you know, don't cool climate. If you do Cabernet, try to get classic Cabernet from Kunuara and, and WA. Uh, there's a lot of good value in WA Cabernet, which Dan Murphy doesn't sell, and it's quite cheap. And Shiraz, well, Shiraz is Heathcote, Barossa Valley, two of the premium real estate grounds, followed by McLaren uh, and many others, many others, many others, uh, Bendigo and, and Pyrenees and so forth. So this is um, really a, a way to move forward and uh, just experiment. Hey, you're free. You know, you can do whatever you want. What makes a good glass? Should they be filled to the widest part? Yes. Yeah, good one. Yeah, yeah. So here, I'm going to try this. If you fill it to the widest part, assuming that the glass is this normal shape, red wine or white wine glass, it is pretty much a rule normally of one third full, two third um, air empty. And that really gives you the room to swirl and the room for the aroma to rise. So yes, I'd say yes. And Francis uh, is asking, what was the wine called, the $18 wines from Dance? Can I repeat the three? I've got Wins, Kunoara, I can send it in an email. Uh, that's about $12. Um, not sure if an $18 here, but um, the other one is uh, Innocent Bystander, which I recommend too. Um, label doesn't really show. I'm showing through here. Uh, Innocent Bystander, which is owned by Brown Brothers. 2018 vintage, that's about 20 Pepper Jack, Pepper Tree, that's about 18 uh, or something like that. Um, not too sure if I mentioned something else. Or, but, but, what does having legs mean? Well, exactly that means that you have two, uh, uh, you have some, or tears, you can call them tears. When you swirl it and you swirl it high, the wine will drop down and form legs, legs, tears, same thing. And it depends how fast they fall, how oily they are, that's the legs. And then you can make deductions, you know, if the, the wine is, see in France, it was revered to have good legs, not in good legs on a person, but legs that, were viscous because wherever maturity is hard to achieve, it is worshipped. France is very cool, cool climate, and it's actually when you had a warm year, it was veneered, uh, re revered, sorry, revered amongst many, and, and everybody looked at the syrupy attribute to the wine. In Australia, it's the opposite. You don't want wine to be riper than it is. We have enough heat here. Okay, uh, moving on to another question from Yana. Uh, Hello, Yana. Um, we're enjoying a real estate 13 Kunuara Cabernet. Uh, it probably wouldn't be Kunuara if it's from Red Hill, uh, maybe just Cabernet. Uh, would you comment on the Mornington Peninsula wine generally? Very good wine. This is where you have a future because of global climate change, global warming, if you want to call it. Uh, it's still cool. Some of the best Pinot Noir and the best Chardonnay. Mordek central area north of of, uh, of uh, Peninsula can do Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, Mourodec area and Mourodec estate has done Cabernet Sauvignon. Generally, no. Bit of Shiraz. Shiraz can do better in cool climate than Cabernet. Cabernet needs warmth. Uh, I wouldn't shop Cabernet in Mornington, but Pinot, fantastic. Um, and another question, Anonymous. Uh, how do I tell the difference between smelling red capsicum and green capsicum? Easy. Easy. Get a leaf, go outside your garden, get a leaf, a hard leaf, crush it in your hand and smell it. Smell the chlorophyll. That's sort of almost peppery. That's green capsicum. That's metoxypyrosin. Red capsicum is probably closer to, uh, don't really have red capsicum as a smell, but it's closer to a unripe tomato, maybe something like that. Um, right, we have a few more questions. So we're gonna move a bit faster here because quite a few questions here. Condition of wine long term in home cellar, 13 in winter, 22 in summer? No, uh, not sure how to read the questions. Just a quick statement 23, 22 degrees is too warm for your wine. Long term, no good. Short term, okay. Keep it constant uh, around 18, max 17, ideally 14. 22 will be just too warm, will we'll, we'll accelerate the way the wine tastes. Not in a good way, by the way. Another one, Anonymous, how do so many aroma come from grapes? 
Aroma come from a number of different things, mostly from alcohol and acidity. They're called ester uh, and, and, and various other uh, uh, flavoring compounds which are carried through through the alcohol uh, to your nose. Uh, fermentation is responsible alone for producing many, many of those. This is why when you smell a wine, you can't really smell a fresh grape. You smell a lot of other things like leather, hang meat, spice, pepper, cherry, because of fermentation. Uh, and that creates all of those esters. It's very complex. I am not really scientifically driven, uh, but it's um, the beauty of wine, I should say. Another one, what would be the best pick from Aldi? Ah, you know what? So generally speaking, I don't know what they have at the moment. I had some wines from Aldi. Just quickly on Aldi, um, they're very clever. They got a very good buying team. And I used to judge in the international Melbourne competition, which was about wine purchases, wine purchasing people like myself, I, I do buy wine for a big company. And, and, and they were the judges. And a lot of those wines with gold medals ended up being in Aldi because they were super cheap. Uh, we thought they were good for the price and uh, Aldi just trumpeted its their medals. And a lot of the wines that are there are just really worthwhile going. It's hard to go wrong because selection is small and it's rigorously checked by somebody quite clever tasting wines. Campbell, I love French oak in whites and some reds. Which wines are best with oak and what is the difference be between different benefits with old and new oak? Merci. Um, okay, it's a big question. I'll try to keep it simple and short. Um, French oak is the best, of course, because it's French. Ha, 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 ha. Um, so we don't... New oak is thrown upon why it wasn't so much 20 years ago. We have a mixture of new and old. A new, a one year old barrel, new oak, one year old, will be only 20 or 30% component of a Chardonnay finished blend, while the rest will be unoaked and most of it will be two year old and three year old, just to get that balance right. Too much oak is that vanilla character, which I a little bit get in the pepper tree, unfortunately. But good oak is just a little bit there for support. You don't want oak to shine through. If you want to be gawky wine, um, you know, they're more harder to find. Go, if you want Chardonnay with oak, go for older style or go to WA uh, uh, in, in um, Margaret River. They seem to have more oak because they're bigger fruits there. Okay, another question. With regards to Cabernet, what difference do you experience between, I oh, this just jumped. No, what do you experience between Kunawara versus uh, WA versus cooler climate. Well, they are cool climates, technically speaking, Kunawara and WA. I can comment on the difference of Kunawara and WA, Margaret River. Kunawara is, is classic uh, and has this sort of a bit more richness. WA has longer summer and the tannin seems to be softer, more polished, and is really a strong giveaway when you do blind tasting, you don't know what the wine is, and you put your nose to it, and say, oh my God, this is full of medoxyparazin. Say what? It's full of capsicum crushed leaf. Chances is, it is Margaret River. They do so well in that respect. So there's more there than anywhere else. So that's a big difference. It's a good one to know if you want to really impress your friends on blind tasting. Christian from Jenny, uh, could you let us know which we will be tasting for the next two weeks. Yes, um, I haven't been giving specifics to um, uh, 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 Dan Murphy specific brands, but we can maybe look at that. Uh, but definitely will be a Chardonnay from the Yarra Valley, definitely. Definitely will be a Riesling from the Clare and a Sauvignon Blanc from Marlboro. So then the popular brands from Dan Murphy I will shop, but I can let you know. Hopefully I'll see if I can uh, organize that with Nick. Next question, with regards to Cabernet, what difference do you experience between Cabernet? Oh no, so I did that. Dum, dum, dum. That's already said. Edwina, hello. Are there any rules of thumb in terms of stirring wine if you don't get through a whole bottle in one sitting? Good question. Somebody has to ask it. Now, yes, put it in the fridge straight away. Cork, don't let the air, the air is the biggest enemy in a long-term situation uh, uh, in a very obvious way, like an open bottle. Cork in there. If you have a argon bottle of gas, which I suspect you might not, squirt a bit of argon or carbon dioxide. Maybe even your soda streamer can put a bit of carbon dioxide through there. If you have a soda streamer, you might have that. 
try to dispense a bit of carbon dioxide on a top that will shield it from oxygen. I'll keep it for quite a while. Half a bottle of wine, which you might have, mine a half, yours might not be, because you might not drink as much as I do, but uh, they will keep in your fridge for two days. If they're red, two, three days, it should be all right. White, a bit less. Just try to drink them as early as you can, because you will trade subtle flavors each day. Every day you come back, you come back after half an hour, an hour, it'll be improving rather than decreasing, but after a day, you'll decrease. You know, the floral primary will drop, more secondary and tertiary. Okay, we're getting to the end. Mick, hello Mick, where we've been enjoying Tassie Pinot Noir lately. Do you have any favorite from Tasmania? Oh yes, my big favorite is uh, uh, Anna Pulli. She makes an amazing Pinot Noir, uh, which is Pulli wines, a number of different vineyards. It's just a cracking wine, really. A single one out, there's many, many others, but they're just my go-to. Uh, I've got uh, half my cellar full of Pulli, which does very well. And Two last ones, second last. Can you please tell us which wines you'll be using for the white now? So we said that, sorry. So really last question. Are there any good cellar management apps to record my wines and tell me the best time to drink it? Yes, they are. I don't use any. My cellar is actually too small. I have like what's called a current account rather than a saving account. You might have a saving account, lucky you. For me, a lot goes in, a lot goes out. Uh, it's not holding well. Um, so I um, think that uh, the best way, a rule of, a, a golden rule here, always buy more than one bottle. First of all, to track how it's going and in case a wine is cork tainted, which we cover in session three. So always have more than one bottle so we can actually follow it through. Uh, but yeah, if you want a uh, cellar up, you'd have to shop. I'm sorry, I can't be specific. My rule is always have more than one so that they can always fall back and having a sense and an idea of how long each variety can last. And, and, and then you can actually do it quite well. Now, thank you so much. Um, it's been a blast having you. So I know that we are quite busy. Now this has been overwhelming response on this first session. So if you haven't got your name down for next week, I suggest you put it down. Uh, and hopefully you get Dean, so there'll be a cutoff. We do have a cutoff because we can't have more than a certain number of people in these Zoom meetings. Um, but happy to have you on. Look forward to see you next week. Be safe, uh, more importantly, be sane, and I'm sure this will help you along the way. Cheers, everyone, and hopefully see you next week. <laughs>